Hey everybody, welcome to Mammoth Interactive's YouTube channel. First of all, I want to thank you for watching this video. And remember that this channel doesn't do Patreon, instead we sell our digital courses down below. And every single dollar that we get from the products you buy below goes into making more content. The best way to help out this channel and Mammoth Interactive is to subscribe to Mammoth Interactive's huge library of content. Get thousands of hours and hundreds of courses for a low, low price down below. We have a monthly option and a yearly option. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the video. Hello everyone and welcome to our course, Building Smart Contracts for the Cardano Blockchain. In this course, we're going to learn how we can use Marlowe Haskell to build smart contracts for Cardano. Starting off, we'll do a course overview in this lecture, talking about what we will learn in this course and what you will need. First, we're going to learn about the blockchain and how smart contracts work. Then we're going to learn the fundamentals of coding in Haskell and Marlowe. And finally, we'll use Marlowe embedded in Haskell to code smart contracts for Cardano. First, we're going to do an introduction to blockchain. We'll talk about what is Cardano and what is a smart contract. Then we'll learn how to code in Haskell and Marlowe because we're going to be using Marlowe embedded in Haskell to program smart contracts. And finally, we'll build eight contracts, including a simple send crypto contract, send a selectable amount of crypto contract, an escrow contract, pay employees contract, a token exchange contract, a fundraiser contract, an escrow contract with a collateral, and a discount bond contract. You don't need any programming experience to take this course, although it will help. As well, you don't need any blockchain. We'll tell you everything you need to know from scratch. But of course, experience would help. You also don't need any financial experience, but of course that would help. We will teach you everything from the ground up. What will you need to take this course? You won't need to download and install any software for this course because we're going to be using free online code editors. First, for learning how to code in Haskell, we're going to be using the free online code editor known as REPL IT. Just go to REPLIT.com slash languages slash Haskell and you can start coding in Haskell. You don't even have to sign up, you can just start coding on the web. As well, to build smart contracts in Marlowe Haskell, we're going to be using another free online code editor. Just go to alpha.marlowe.iohkdev.io. Here we can build smart contracts in a number of different languages, and we can also test their implementation. So you can build your contracts and test them without deploying them. Therefore, you won't have to download or install anything as long as you have internet access you can take this course. And that is an overview of what you will learn in this course and what you will need. It's quite a fun course and great for beginners. Join me in our next section where we'll get started learning about the blockchain. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we're going to learn what is a blockchain. And later on in this section, we'll talk about the Cardano blockchain specifically and how to build smart contracts. Blockchain technology was created with Bitcoin in 2008. The number one priority property of blockchain is to establish trust between two or more parties like me and you without needing any intermediaries or middle man. Blockchain also opened a new era in programming. A blockchain is a time-stamped series of immutable transactions in other words, timestamps or dates and times of transactions that cannot be changed. The records of a blockchain aren't owned by any single entity, like they're not owned by a bank. Instead, they're managed by a cluster of computers using special computer algorithms. Blockchain nodes. A blockchain is a system of decentralized nodes. So it's a decentralized person-to-person -person network of nodes. Each node in the network shares the same copy of data. And this copy of data is known as a digital ledger. 
Each node uses the same algorithm to reach a consensus. A blockchain ledger is resistant to changing data. The ledger records transactions between two parties, like me and you, in a verifiable and permanent way. When there's a change in the ledger using transactions, for example, when a transaction is made, like if I send you some crypto, changes are distributed to all the nodes in the network. And these nodes will verify and update their own copy of the ledger. A blockchain is immutable. Once a transaction is stored and verified by all the nodes in the network, we can't change the transaction without changing all the previous and next blocks. And we can't do that. Therefore, the blockchain transactions are irreversible. Transactions and their data are append only. You can't remove them from blockchain. Transaction reversal is very hard, although it has been done rarely in attacks, and these attacks result in a loss of cryptocurrency. But again, this is extremely hard. A person-to-person -person network is a network where each computer is a node in the network. A node maintains the records of transactions in consecutive blocks, one block after the other. This type of network structure person to person is also seen in torrents, but torrents are not like blockchains because torrent networks are designed to share files only. A decentralized ledger is another name for a blockchain because each node keeps the same copy of the ledger. Therefore, the network is decentralized. There's no central entity. We have a chain of connected blocks instead. Each block is connected with a link, and the link is implemented with a record of the cryptographic hash of the previous block in each block for security. And you can visit the chain in reverse order because the chain is chronological. You may be wondering, what is the difference between traditional software that processes a transaction versus a blockchain that processes a transaction? Why would I use a blockchain instead of going to a bank? Well, a traditional server like the bank or the stock exchange, these networks are centralized. The bank, for example, is the central entity. They're not decentralized. As well, these servers are continuously attacked and attackers can change the database and put in fake entries. Also, with a bank or stock exchange, fees are higher and you're also limited with time because you have to wait for the stock exchange to open or you have to wait for the bank to open. So there are limits. And the bank gets a fee and they control the transaction. But with a blockchain, you have no middleman, so costs are a lot cheaper. You don't lose credit card fees, for example. And the blockchain is open 24-7. It's also a lot more secure. The blockchain solved a hard problem in computer science when it was invented, known as the double spending problem. Let's talk about the double spending problem. When you share a document or a picture on the internet, you're actually sharing a copy of the file. But something like money can't be shared as a copy because then it would just be forgery. If I sent you a copy of my money for a service, then we both still have the money, so I'm not actually sending you value. You also shouldn't share bonds or shares as a copy. That is the double spending problem. And blockchain solved that problem with this technique. With the value transfer, it allows you to share money without copies, but you have to use a trusted third party like a bank or a stock exchange. That's why those things exist. The trusted middle party will process your transactions, but that's a centralized system. The blockchain doesn't need the middleman, doesn't need the bank or the stock exchange. Instead, we can do safe transactions directly thanks to blockchain's decentralized network and a consensus algorithm to ensure transaction safety and to prevent fraud. So I don't have to trust you, I just have to trust the blockchain to send my money to you. And then I can verify that you received my money because the blockchain 
can allow me to see whether a, a transaction was indeed confirmed and if it was sent properly. So with the blockchain, you have solved the double spending problem because I'm now able to send you, for example, money, and I'm able to do that without using a copy of the money or without using a middleman like the bank or the stock market. And that is what a blockchain does. In this lecture, you learned what is a blockchain, what is the structure of a blockchain, how does it work, and why is it different from using something like a bank. Coming up, we're going to look specifically at what is the Cardano blockchain, because in this course, we're going to be building smart contracts for the Cardano blockchain. For example, we'll build a contract that can send cryptocurrency from me to you on the Cardano blockchain. There are many types of blockchains. The Bitcoin blockchain was the first. So join me in our next lecture where we'll talk about the Cardano blockchain. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we are doing an introduction to Cardano, the Cardano blockchain, and we'll break down what is Cardano. Cardano is an open source proof of stake blockchain that began in 2015. Its goal is to address existing blockchain challenges in the design and development of cryptocurrencies. The goals of Cardano are specifically to provide a more balanced and sustainable ecosystem and to account for the needs of users and other systems that are looking for integration. Let's talk about other blockchains first before we talk about the Cardano blockchain. The Bitcoin blockchain was the first generation of blockchain that offered a decentralized ledger for secure cryptocurrency transfer. Bitcoin did not provide a functional environment for complex deal settlement and decentralized application development. So then there came the Ethereum blockchain, a second generation blockchain. The Ethereum blockchain provided more enhanced solutions for writing and executing smart contracts, for developing applications, and for creating tokens. But the Ethereum blockchain didn't solve all problems. For example, there were still issues with scaling. Then we come to the Cardano blockchain, a third generation blockchain. Of course, other blockchains, including the Bitcoin blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain, are still very widely used. The Cardano blockchain is just another blockchain. This blockchain combines the properties of prior generations like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and it evolves to meet all the arising needs of users. Let's talk about what makes a good blockchain. Well, for a blockchain to be considered good, you want to have as high security as possible. As well, you want your blockchain chain to be scalable. It has to be able to handle a high transaction throughput, meaning a lot of data and transactions. It has to be able to scale with the data and handle network bandwidth. As well, a good blockchain should enable transaction processing and all means for business deal settlement. So you should be able to completely handle the deal. A blockchain should be sustainable and constantly improving. As well, it should be interoperable with other blockchains and with financial institutions. So is Cardano a good blockchain? Does it meet the requirements of a good blockchain? Well, yes, it does. Cardano was evolved to solve a lot of the issues with Bitcoin and Ethereum, the first and second generation blockchains. Cardano is scalable. So the Cardano ledger can process many transactions without affecting performance. And Cardano has higher bandwidth capabilities than other blockchains. As well, Cardano is interoperable. It's the most multifunctional environment for financial, business, or commercial operations. Cardano enables users like you or me to interact with multiple currencies across various blockchains. Cardano is sustainable. It allows the community to participate in developing its open source. And the treasury is refilled from minted coins, stake pool rewards, and transaction fees. So the sustainability of Cardano is funded. And that is an introduction to Cardano. Coming up next, we're going to do more theory 
on Cardano smart contracts and how to build them so you'll have even more information about Cardano and how it works. Join me in our next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we are going to discuss what is a smart contract because in this course, we are going to be building smart contracts for the Cardano blockchain using Haskell Marlowe. First, let's talk about a regular contract. A contract by definition is a legally binding agreement. It recognizes and governs the rights and duties of the parties to the agreement. A smart contract is similar in that it is going to create an agreement between two parties. But specifically, a smart contract is a program. And typically it's a short program whose inputs and outputs are transactions on a blockchain. So you can perform some kind of task, like you can send crypto, whether that's ADA, the default for Cardano or another token. As long as the token is supported by Cardano, you can use it in the smart contract. So you could send funds, you could receive funds, you could buy crypto, trade it, you could set up a lottery or a fundraiser, you could pay employees or split profits among your team, any kind of financial contract you want to create. You can do that with a smart contract. And in this course, we're going to be building different types of smart contracts. A smart contract, therefore, is an automated digital agreement. You'll write the code for it and then you'll deploy it and it can be put to use. A smart contract tracks, verifies, and executes the binding transactions of a contract between various parties. For example, I can use a smart contract to send crypto from me to you. When conditions are met, the transaction of the contract, whether it's one or multiple, are executed by the smart contract, but the conditions must be met. A smart contract is self-executing. You don't need any kind of third party. It is reliable and it does not require any middleman. The code for a smart contract is stored on and distributed across a decentralized blockchain network. The code is transparent and irreversible. Some features of smart contracts are that they're immutable it's very hard to change them once they're deployed on the blockchain. They're distributable and tamper-proof. They are secure. As well, they are fast and affordable, and they're encrypted. Smart contracts for the Cardano blockchain specifically can be written in multiple languages. The supported languages are Plutus, Marlow, and Glow. Let's talk about these different languages that are used for writing smart contracts. Plutus is one such. It's a smart contract development and execution platform. With Plutus contracts, some parts run on the blockchain and some parts run on the user's machine, known as off-chain or client code. Plutus draws from modern language research and provides a safe full-stack programming environment. It is based on Haskell, which is the leading functional programming language. We're going to learn more about Haskell in this course. Then there's also Marlow, another option for building smart contracts. This is what we're going to use in this course. We're going to use Marlow. We're going to use Marlow combined with Haskell, which is a hybrid that allows you to program smart contracts. Marlow is a domain specific language which is a computer language specialized to a particular application domain. We're going to learn more about Marlow shortly in this course. So Marlow is a domain specific language, not a general purpose language. A general purpose language is broadly applicable across domains, whereas a domain specific language is different because it's specialized. And Marlow is an example of such a specialized language. Marlow is used for writing and executing financial contracts. You can build contracts visually or programmatically. You can build with just pure Marlow code or use Marlow Haskell to inject more of a readable programming aspect to your smart contracts. That's what we're going to be doing in this course. We're going to be using Marlow 
as well as Haskell combined together to build clean contracts. As well with Marlowe, you can develop and deploy custom financial instruments. Marlowe is embedded in JavaScript and Haskell. We're going to be using, in this course, Marlowe embedded in Haskell because Haskell is a leading functional programming language or a leading functional language. And Haskell is very suited for finance, so we're going to be using Marlowe embedded in Haskell. But there is also the option of Marlowe embedded in JavaScript. Coming up later in this course, we're going to learn more about Haskell before we then start building contracts with Marlowe Haskell. Because Haskell can take some time to understand if you've never seen it before, because it is a functional language. And we'll talk more about that when we get there. There's also Glow, another newer option. Glow is also a domain specific language. And with Glow, you can develop decentralized applications on the blockchain and you can write secure dApps. Glow ensures that smart contracts run safely in an adversarial environment. So Glow is another option, though less popular. And that is a smart contract. In this lecture, you learned what is a smart contract and how do you build smart contracts specifically for the Cardano blockchain. Coming up next, we are going to learn more about how to build smart contracts for Cardano. So I will see you in our next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we are going to do an overview of what is Haskell. And then we're going to jump into some hands-on projects where we're actually going to code in Haskell ourselves. Haskell is a language for building smart contracts on the Cardano blockchain. It's often used with Marlowe or Plutus to build smart contracts. Marlowe is written as a Haskell data type. Therefore, it's straightforward to create Marlowe smart contracts with Haskell. And that's exactly what we are going to be doing in this course. Haskell is also the preferred language for writing high reliability software because financial programs may lose millions of dollars to a bug. So you have to have a reliable language. One of the reasons that Haskell is used so often in financial programs is because with Haskell, you can prove the correctness of a program with equational reasoning which means you can prove that one expression is equal to another. You can prove that an account has this much money. It's straightforward to do equational reasoning with Haskell. So often equational reasoning is even automated with theorem provers that take Haskell programs as input. Because the Haskell language can support equational reasoning in a straightforward manner. Where can we practice Haskell? Well, we're going to be using a free online code editor. You don't even have to sign up to practice. You can just start coding right on the web. Just go to repelit.com slash languages slash Haskell. And there you can try out Haskell. And that's what we're going to be doing in this section. Haskell is a functional language. This means that function calls and function definitions form a major part of your program. It's very useful to learn to understand the function call syntax and function definition syntax in Haskell before you throw yourself into a project. The reason being that Haskell can be confusing if you've never read it or looked at it before. So we're going to be covering the syntax before we dive into building our own projects. A functional language means that the syntax for function calls and function definitions is reduced to a bare minimum. So you're going to have very bare bones functions that are written as quickly and minimalist as possible. This is because Haskell is a functional language, so you want to make it as easy and fast as possible to write functions. But this does make Haskell programs hard to read for beginners if you've never seen it before. But that's what this section is for, is to show you how you can read Haskell, understand it, and also code it yourself. All right, so as mentioned, the syntax for functions is the bare minimum in Haskell. Any series of identifiers is a function call or a function application. 
A function call is the same thing as a function application. It's the use of a function. Here's an example of a function call or a function application. In this case, we're using a function called setDate. This function, you have to create it yourself, but then you can use it. And here's an example of the usage. First, you call the function name setDate. Then you pass the function the arguments that it expects. So when you define the function setDate, you will define what it expects to take. So to set the date, the function needs to know the day, the month, and the year. So it expects that when you use this function, you will tell it the day, the month, and the year. Otherwise, the function can't run. Set date is the function name. It's what we write first, followed by the arguments. Here's an example of set date to use in that online code editor. Don't worry if you don't understand all this. We're going to be going through it coming up in this section and doing it ourselves. But as an overview, here we're first creating set date. So we have set date, day, month, year, then we're assigning it to equal its functionality or, or what it does. A function is specifically for performing some task. In this case, we're going to take the day, month, and the year, and we're going to print it out in the format of, for example, July 1st, 2100. After that, we have three variables defined, day, month, and year. Day is first, month is July, and year is 2100. Then we have a main keyword. This is what opens the application, the main line. You always have to have a main line, otherwise your application can't open. We have main to equal put string align, which means we're going to have a line onto which we're going to call set date, day, month, year. So in this case, we're passing our variables day, month, year to the function set date. And that is the function call or the function application. So a function performs a task and a variable stores data. In this case, we're storing some strings, which means a sequence of characters. We're storing first July and 2100 as strings, as a sequence of characters. These two are equivalent. You can wrap the call to the function in parentheses. However, if you want to use the syntax that you may be familiar with from other programming languages, you should beware because in another programming language, like for example, JavaScript, you will pass in arguments via parentheses and then you have a comma separating each argument. But that actually cannot be done in Haskell unless the function itself expects a tuple or a finite ordered list. So you have to make sure the parentheses are wrapping in the function definition and the function call if you want to include them separated by commas. Otherwise, typically we'll just be not separating the arguments by commas. Haskell will just expect that whatever is after the function name on the same line must be the arguments that the function is going to take in. As well, you can do math in Haskell. There are many infix operators like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division with just plus, minus, asterisk, or the forward slash. You also have integral and floating point numbers, meaning you can have integers or whole numbers, and you can also have decimals in Haskell. Function application has the highest precedence. We're going to look more into precedence when we get into our hands-on examples. But as a quick example, what do you think this here would output? We have a function defined called add numbers which takes in one argument x, and then in the equal sign, whatever comes after the equal sign means that's what the function is going to actually do. So the function add numbers is going to take x and just add it to itself, x plus x. Then we have our main line, which is calling print to print a new line. And the dollar sign then opens up what we want to print. We want to print add numbers, and we're passing add numbers what looks to be four plus five. But the result may actually be different from what you expect. The result is actually 13. Because a function call has first precedence, so if you're familiar with bed mass or order of operations, function calling will precede all of that. Meaning that I'm actually passing in only four to the add numbers function. Therefore, we're going to return four plus four, which is eight, and then add five, which is 13. 
The plus five only gets added after, even though there's no white space between the four and the five and the plus sign. You may have expected for a nine to be sent to add numbers and then the result being nine plus nine, which is 18, but in actuality, that doesn't happen because in Haskell, function calling has precedence. If you want to get 18, you have to wrap four plus five in parentheses. And we're going to be looking more at this concept of function precedence in Haskell later on because it is quite an important thing to understand about Haskell. As well, you must parenthesize negative numbers. I can't pass add numbers a negative one. It will just try to pass it the minus sign again because of function precedence. And when you pass a minus sign, it means you're trying to subtract something, but we don't want that. We want to actually pass in negative one. So therefore you have to wrap negative numbers in parentheses. A function can take another function as an argument as well. You'll see that later on. And those are the fundamentals of Haskell. Next up, now that you know the fundamentals, we are going to jump into coding ourselves with Haskell. So join me at that code editor, REPL.IT, where you can code in Haskell. Just go to REPLIT.com slash languages slash Haskell. That is where we're going to get started with some hands-on applications of Haskell. This will help us to understand much better how Haskell works because we're going to actually code in Haskell ourselves. Then later on in this course, we're going to use Haskell together with Marlow to build smart contracts. But in order to actually understand what's going on in the smart contracts, we have to understand how to actually code in Haskell first. So join me in our next lecture where we will get started. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we are going to get started with coding our first Haskell lines. Join me at the online code editor for Haskell. Just go to repelit.com slash languages slash Haskell. Here we can already see we have one line of Haskell code. We can choose any language we want. We're using Haskell. If you ever get some error messages here, then just refresh the page and go back and try again because sometimes the editor can stall. This first line here is just created for us by default by REPL IT. We have our main line here. Every program needs to have one function called main. So this already here is a function. You can see it has a name here and it's equal to something. In this case, it's a function because it's doing something. It's not storing a value. Here we have a call to put a string line. This is a pre-made function by Haskell, so we didn't have to make it ourselves. And this is going to just print here into our console, hello world. And we can see that on the right hand side, we have a console. And first it tells us where we are. We're inside of main.hs, which is the name of this little file. Then we have compiling main, linking main, which means we're compiling the Haskell code into computer code. Then we're linking main to show its results in the console. Then we have dot slash main to show that we're here in the main file. And we're printing hello world because that's what the function inside of the main file in the main function, which will always be run when the program is run. That's what it says it should do. It should print hello world. And then we can put in anything else we want. For example, I can say hi. And you can see here I'm writing in bash because I get a bash message, hi command not found. But with Haskell, you can have functions that expect some input from the user. So if I had that, then I could type in some value here, press enter, and then the function would use it. That would be if my function actually did that. But in, in my case, my function just says hello world, and I can rerun with no problems. Just make sure if you want to actually save this code for the long term that you create an account, because if I refresh this page, it's actually going to clear any changes that I made. You can also just save this by copying it and pasting it into your own code editor. Just copying the code here, pasting it to your own and saving it as a .hs file, which is the file extension for Haskell. All right, so now we can see we have this main function created for us, but let's create our own function next. So we're going to create our own first Haskell function. On the left-hand side of the equal sign, 
we have the name of the function. Let's call our function set date. Then we'll have an equal sign followed by what we want the function to do. For example, we could have the function put string line and we could have it say set the date. So in this case, I'm now having put string line called, but I want it to print my own thing instead of hello world. How do I actually now run set date? Because if I rerun this code, nothing actually changes. Well, if I want the application to actually see and use set date, I have to put that here into main. So I can set main, for example, to equal set date. Then I'll run this code and look at that. Now I have here set the date. The reason being that the main function will always be executed by default whenever you run your program. The compiler is looking specifically for the keyword main because it knows that is the entry point to your application. So that's why I was able to call set date. If I didn't have a main function, then I would get compiler errors that would show up here in the console. All right, now let's add a bit more. Let's add an argument into our set date function. For example, let's add in a date argument. So now we have a function set date, but because there's a space after it followed by date, the Haskell syntax or the grammar of the language expects that date is an argument of set date. It will know. And whenever you use set date, you now have to give it a date because it expects that. So now I have to give it some kind of date value. So let's create a variable called date and I can call this my date argument to make it clear that it's an argument. It's being passed in here. Then I'm going to create date argument and let's call this something like, for example, July 1st, 2100. All right, so I've created a variable here. A variable stores data. So it's like a box that you put in some data. In this case, my data is a string or a sequence of characters, July 1st, 2100. And I have these in double quotation marks because they're a string. If I wanted to have something like an integer, I could just put it directly like this and it will be treated as an integer. Therefore, I can do math with it, but I can't do math on strings. So here I've created a variable. The variable name is date argument. You're always going to have the name on the left-hand side of the equal sign and the value on the right-hand side of the equal sign. Then I am passing that date argument to set date. So set date is actually going to use the date argument as its date that it expects. So even though date argument does not have the same name as date, that's fine because they're in the same position. They're the first argument after the name of the function. Then I can run this function and we don't have anything changed yet. Well, because we're not actually using date inside of set date, but we could, for example, we could put string line instead of a string here, we could put in date. So this time I can run my program and look at that. Now I have printed July 1st, 2100. We can also separate date argument into three different arguments. For example, I can have the day be first, the month be July, and the year be 2100. All right, and there we go. Now we have three different arguments and we can pass them to set date. I can pass day, month, and year. So every argument is just separated by a white space. But because I've now added two extra arguments to set date, my set date is actually going to expect two extra arguments. So I have to add those two extra arguments into the definition of the function. In other words, where the function was defined or created. If I added it, to where the function was called and vice versa. We always have to have the exact same match. So instead of having just one argument for set date, I'm going to have three now, day, month, and year to match the call. All right, and now I also have to change date because date no longer exists. Instead, I can try put string line day instead. Now, look at that, we have first being printed out here in the console. What if I wanted to put to use all of these instead of just day what if I wanted to put to use month and year as well well no problem you can do that for example we could say 
that we want to put string line we can put the month plus a space plus the day plus a comma plus the year so that's going to show me july first comma 20 2100 the one problem is that put string line actually expects only one argument so if you try to put in multiple arguments after put string line you'll get this error could not match expected type a list of chars which is a string with the actual type io so what we have to do is just remove put string line from the set date function and instead just put put string line instead into main and as well add a dollar sign here after that the dollar sign is going to ensure that all of the code to the right of the dollar sign gets executed before all the code to the left of the dollar sign. And we'll be talking more about that later on in this section. The dollar sign is like a splitter to make sure all the code happens first on the right and then on the left. Otherwise, we're calling set date into put string line and that won't work because remember a function call has order precedence. So main will be executed left to right and first we'll go to put string line and then we'll try to feed it set date because put string line only takes in one argument but then that will be invalid because set date can't work without day month year so that's why we need that dollar sign to ensure that first set date sets the date and then we feed that entire result which is a string to put string line also notice we're using here double plus signs that's because we're adding strings, which is known as concatenation. We're not actually doing math. If we wanted to do math, we would use a single plus sign. And that's only for numbers. We can't do that with strings. So that's why we have to use the double plus sign to say that we're just putting all the strings together one after the other. All right, and now look at that. Our program is running. I can as well Take note that when you zoom in or out here in this site, it doesn't actually zoom in or out the text. So if you want to, you can just sign up to make an account and you can see a more complicated editor where it has more zooming functionality and a larger screen. But you don't have to sign up, but it is free if you want to sign up, you'll get a little bit better of an experience. All right, and just like that, we have created our first function in Haskell. Join me coming up in our next lecture we're going to talk more about argument precedence and we're going to build an example of argument precedence we already saw one example here with argument precedence where we use this dollar sign to ensure that set date gets completely executed before it's passed into put string line because without the dollar sign we're trying to pass in set date without any arguments to put string line and we got an error so we are going to build an example to better understand argument precedence in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we are going to look at another example of argument precedence. As we learned in the previous lecture, a function call has the priority in terms of argument precedence. Let's build an example to best understand this concept. So I'm going to create a new function. I will call this my add numbers function. This will take in some number like x and it will just add it to itself. Then inside of main, I can't use put string line anymore because put string line always requires a string, but the add numbers function, it's going to return a number because we're using the addition operator here, which can only be used on numbers. So I'm going to remove that line completely. And instead I'm going to call print because the print function, it can print strings and also numbers. Then I'm going to use a dollar sign to separate the print call from whatever I'm going to put after that. I'm going to then call add numbers and pass in some value such as one. So here I'm calling add numbers and I'm feeding it X. In this case, X is just one. I have to use this dollar sign, otherwise the print statement would be executed first and I would be passing it add numbers with nothing inside of add numbers. So I would actually just get a compiler error. That's why I need to include that dollar sign because the dollar sign 
it's going to split these two pieces. It's going to split print into one side and add numbers one onto the other side. And whatever's on the right of add numbers gets executed first. And then whatever on the left is going to get executed next. So the dollar sign will split the code like that. We're going to look more at the dollar sign operator later on in this section. For now, all you have to know is that we're passing in add numbers one into the print function. So if I run this code, we are going to get a result of two because first we're passing in one to add numbers, then we're adding one plus one, so we get two. But what if I did something else? What if I passed in here one plus two? So this time it may appear that I'm passing in three to add numbers, but in actuality, that is not the case. In actuality, writing one plus two is the same whether you have a space or not. The white space doesn't matter in that case. So actually, what we're doing is we're passing one to add numbers first, and then we're adding two after that. So that's actually what's going on here. The reason being argument precedence. A function call always has argument precedence. So that means that when this line is being compiled, add numbers, it's going to be read left to right. Add numbers one. Because that fulfills the function, it calls the function name and it gives one argument to the function, the function is actually going to be executed. And then only after that is the compiler going to continue to the plus two. And that's because a function call has the priority in terms of argument precedence. Now, if you wanted to actually include one plus two as one unit, you would wrap them in parentheses. So in that case, the parentheses actually are going to get executed first. So that is the one exception there. All right, and so that shows us two examples of argument precedence. First, the one plus two, and then also the dollar sign. That's also an example of argument precedence. If I wanted to print something like just two on its own, I could do that by calling print two. But if I try to do something like print two plus two, well, in that case, I'm going to get a compiler error. For example, as well, if I wanted to print two plus a string, hello, or even hi plus hello, again, that will not work because print expects only one argument, print hi, for example. All right, and that is how we can better understand argument precedence. Coming up later in this course, you're going to continue understanding it better as we build more code. Join me coming up in our next lecture. We're going to talk more about this dollar notation. So join me over there. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we are going to build an example to better understand dollar notation in Haskell. Let's get started. All right. Let's create another function inside of this default editor here. I'll call this add numbers. It's going to take in X and it's just going to add X to itself. Then inside of main, I'm going to call a print statement and I'm going to use dollar notation that I'm going to call add numbers and I'll pass in here X. So already I'm using the dollar notation here. The white space operator is actually an operator itself. So a white space acts as an operator in Haskell. The white space has the highest precedence and binds to the left. So that means by default, we have left binding. We're going to compile the code from left to right. So the compiler will read the code from left to right. And also that's how it's going to decide what will be executed first. So if I didn't have this dollar sign, the code would be read left to right. So I'd call print and then I would try to print add numbers X. And you'll see if you run this code cell, you won't be able to do that because the print statement only takes in a one argument, add numbers. And therefore this code can't work because add numbers is a function. It's not a variable. I could do something like just print numbers X and then I could define X to equal two. 
then I can call print x, but I can't call print add numbers x with just white space operators. I have to add in here a dollar sign. So this dollar sign is another operator and it's known as the dollar operator. It's actually the opposite of the white space operator. A dollar sign has the lowest precedence and it binds to the right. So this means anything to the right of the dollar sign is going to be operated and performed first and then we'll perform anything on the left. So in this case, if I run my code cell, look at that. Now we have four being printed. So this was able to successfully compile and to run. Instead of using a dollar sign, another alternative could be parentheses. If I run this program here, you'll find that the parentheses have the same effect as the dollar sign did. We have four again. The parentheses wrap something to ensure that they happen together. So instead of calling print on add numbers, we're calling print on add numbers x. So first we'll perform what's happening inside of the parentheses and then we'll pass that result to the print statement. So those two are the same using the dollar sign versus parentheses. As well, what if we wanted to call another function inside of one? So remember in Haskell, you can call functions inside of other functions. For example, let's call print and let's call add numbers again. But this time, what if we wanted to pass in here add numbers, but I wanted to pass in something like the square root of, we can do 25. Well, in this case, I want to pass add numbers, not square root, but actually the keyword is square root in Haskell, because square root is a keyword that will square root something. To do that, I have to wrap my square root inside of parentheses, because I want first the square root 25 to happen, which will give me a result of five, and then I'll pass that five to add numbers. So here, I'm calling a function inside of the argument of another function, which is allowed in Haskell. But what if I didn't want to use parentheses? Well, I could just replace the parentheses with another dollar sign. So this means we're going to execute anything to the right of the rightmost dollar sign first, and then we'll keep going from right to left. And look at that, we get the same result, 10. And that is how we can use the dollar notation or the dollar operator to replace parentheses inside of Haskell. Awesome, join me coming up in our next lecture. We're going to look at another Haskell operator known as the dot operator. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we're going to look at another operator in Haskell known as the dot operator. So join me at our code editor. Let's create a function again called add numbers and we're going to take an X and we're just going to add X to itself. All right, then inside of our main function here, we're going to print a value and we're going to look at how we can perform some kind of function before another function. So previously we did something similar where we called add numbers, then we used the dollar operator and we called square root on 25. We can actually just use the dot operator to achieve the same effect. So what I'm going to do is wrap here, add numbers followed by the dot operator, and then I can do something like square root 25. Now I do have to wrap this inside of parentheses here. And let's break down what's going to happen in this case. So here, we are going to be first square rooting 25 and then adding the results. So I'll run this code and we'll see our result. The result will be first 25 will be square rooted, then the result will be added to itself. So we'll get 10. Just give it a moment to compile and link and there we go. We get 10. So the dot operator here 
will allow you to apply a function to the result of another function, and that is known as function composition. The dot operator has very high precedence. The only type that has higher precedence than the dot operator is function calling or function application. So we're first going to perform what's after the dot, the square root, then we're going to add numbers. That's why we get here a result 25. Now with dot, we can also show here another function known as the identity function or ID. And ID, this is a pre-made function by Haskell. We don't have to define it. And this just doesn't do anything. So ID doesn't change the behavior of the function. It allows you to compose identity with a function, but it doesn't actually change the behavior. So if you want to have just a blank function, you can use the keyword ID. So we can still use this dot operator, but we'll follow it by a blank function. That's why we just have 25. First we go to ID because the dot operator has the highest precedence. Then after we go to ID, which does nothing, we then add numbers. So we're adding 25 plus 25, which is why we get 50. And that is the dot operator in Haskell. Join me coming up in our next lecture where we're going to learn about data types in Haskell and how we can build our own data types as well. So head on over there. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this course. If you want to watch the rest of the course, the link is down below. Not only will you get the access to this course, but you'll get access to a lot of other courses in a huge bundle. And it's on sale today. So buy before the sale ends. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in another video.